in-flight loss of control is now the leading cause of fatal air accidents globally, and the UK Civil Aviation Authority has identified it as one of the significant seven safety risks facing passenger aircraft. This presentation aims to highlight the specific dangers associated with loss of control and how to avoid them leading to an accident. So, what exactly is an upset? It can be summed up as a situation in which an aeroplane is unintentionally outside of its normal flight parameters, such as those defined here. It is unintentional and at inappropriate airspeed. Pilots can avoid these situations if they notice one or more of the parameters being exceeded and a recovery is quickly initiated. A small upset is easily recovered while a large upset can be challenging. Ideally, a pilot will recognize the potential for an upset before it happens. Proper avoidance, recognition and recovery techniques can reduce the number of fatalities in aviation. Think about it. A Boeing statistical study predicted that a 50% reduction in loss of control accidents would save 920 lives over a 10-year period. Every pilot can make a difference by being prepared for an upset event. Experience alone is not enough to prevent an upset. Highly experienced flight crews have found themselves in upsets and not recovered. It is therefore very important that all pilots can recognize an upset early and initiate a proper recovery when needed. Let us look at these three parts of upset training. The easiest and most frequent part of upset training is avoidance. When conditions are conducive to an upset, take steps to circumvent the threat. For example, thunderstorms can produce microbursts that can cause significant upsets, no matter what size aircraft. Being aware of the likely path of wake vortices can prevent an upset before it happens, and icing can lead to a stall long before the stall warning activates. Is the aircraft in an upset? We have already defined the conditions of an upset. Unintentional nose up 25 degrees, nose low 10 degrees, roll of more than 45 degrees, or an airspeed that is inappropriate. If the pitch and or roll is greater, positive or negative than expected, or if there is buffeting, or if a high descent rate does not respond to aft elevator command, or if there is roll that is oscillating, it is possible that the aircraft is, or soon will be, in an upset. By recognizing the condition or potential early, it prepares the pilot to maintain control. A small upset is much easier to recover from than a large one. Proper recovery will vary depending upon the type of upset. This disc also contains a copy of the Upset Recovery Training Aid, Revision 2, and the Royal Aeronautical Society's specialist document, Aeroplane Upset Recovery Training. Take a few minutes to read them. The recovery techniques in this presentation are taken directly from these documents. Again, a reminder. Follow your aeroplane manufacturer's recommendations for upset recovery as it provides specific guidance. In nose-high conditions, pilots must first recognize and confirm the situation. This is true in all types of potential upsets. Disengage the autopilot and autothrottle, as either of them could be the cause of the pending upset. Is the airspeed increasing or decreasing? This trend information can be very valuable to a pilot to determine what may occur next. Is a stall likely? Is an overspeed likely? Knowing the trend of the airspeed can provide answers to those important questions. Push forward on the yoke or stick to command nose down elevator. It may require full control travel and recovery might be slow. If the autopilot has added nose up trim, it may require nose down trim input by the pilot. 
it is possible to roll the aircraft, increase bank angle, to bring the nose down. Remember that a bank angle over 45 degrees is considered an upset condition, therefore do not exceed 45 degrees. Obtain a nose down pitch rate that is satisfactory. Aircraft with underwing mounted engines may require a reduction in thrust as high thrust produces a nose up effect. Then, complete the recovery by returning to normal flight, wings level, appropriate airspeed, and proper pitch. For the nose low recovery, first recognize and confirm the situation. Just like in the nose high recovery, disengage the autopilot and autothrottle, as they may have been the cause of the upset. Note the airspeed and its trend. Is there a full stall or one pending? If the aircraft has stalled, recover from this first. All other recovery maneuvers should follow. Roll the shortest way to wings level. It may be necessary to unload the aeroplane, which means you need to push forward on the control yoke or stick to improve the roll rate. When the wings are nearly wings level, apply nose up elevator to return to a normal pitch attitude. It may be necessary to use stabilizer trim. Adjust thrust and drag to return to normal airspeed. In an upset or potential upset, inaction or improper action can be very dangerous. Awareness of the threat and avoidance is the best course of action. It can make the difference between achieving a successful outcome or becoming a statistic. All pilots learn aerodynamics as part of their training, but how much do you remember today? Too often the theory of aerodynamics fades away from lack of frequent use. Let us revisit a few important aerodynamic principles that apply directly to modern flight operations. There are four forces acting on the aircraft in flight. Lift, weight, thrust and drag. In level flight, at a constant airspeed, the four forces are balanced. The aircraft will climb when there is more lift than weight. It will accelerate when there is more thrust than drag. Pilots can use these forces to make changes to the flight path. To climb, the pilot must increase lift until it is greater than the weight. The same principle holds for deceleration. The pilot must increase drag or decrease thrust. So, how is lift produced? Due to the shape of the wing, air flowing across the upper surface of the wing is faster and at lower pressure than air flowing under the wing. The angle of the wing compared to the flight path is the angle of attack. Understanding angle of attack is critical for all pilots. Knowing the relationship between angle of attack and lift can be life-saving information during an upset. Let us look a little further into the components of lift. The amount of lift produced by an aerofoil is determined by the speed of air flowing over it. Increases in speed or density increase lift. The area of the wing is the third component when determining the amount of lift. The larger the wing, the more lift can be generated. Finally, the angle of attack has a dramatic effect on the lift. As angle of attack is increased, lift increases up to the critical angle of attack. At angles greater than the critical angle of attack, lift decreases and the aerofoil is stalled. This slide shows the relationship between increasing angle of attack and lift. Notice that an increase in angle of attack beyond the critical angle does not produce additional lift, just the reverse. The greater the angle of attack above the critical angle of attack, the less lift is produced. Therefore, it is critical that pilots realize and remember that lowering the angle of attack during a stall is the only way to increase lift. Looking at this wing, it is easy to see the turbulence and airflow distortion which occurs as the wing's angle of attack increases. In this example, at 17 degrees angle of attack, the wing is stalled and lift decreases. 
no matter how much further the angle of attack is increased by adding aft stick or yoke, the wing will remain stalled, producing little or no lift until the angle of attack is reduced below the critical angle, in this example 17 degrees. Only by applying forward stick or yoke can the angle of attack be decreased. A build-up of ice on an aerofoil can and will change its shape. Consequently, the critical angle of attack will also change. A pilot must be aware that any ice on an aerofoil means it will stall at a lower angle of attack. This may be earlier than the activation of stall warning systems. During icing, an aerofoil can stall with no prior warning by the stall warning system. Pilots must be alert to other symptoms of stall, such as buffeting, roll oscillations, and descents that do not respond to aft stick or yoke inputs. Recognizing a stall can be further complicated by autopilots, and this is particularly true during icing. Autopilots will continue to input elevator trim, which can lead to an upset if the pilot does not intervene. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations carefully during flight in icing conditions to minimize the likelihood of an autopilot masking an impending stall. The CAA issued a safety notice in July 2011 to all pilots, emphasizing the need to reduce the angle of attack to ensure controllability during a stall. A copy of this training notice is contained on this disk as a PDF file. Please take the time to read this important safety notice following this presentation. Early recognition of a pending stall is essential to minimize height loss. When reducing the angle of attack, some loss of height may occur. This is acceptable to restore lift to the wing. The amount of height loss should be limited, but attempting to maintain height during recovery should not be part of the recovery maneuver. This simple definition of a stall and the effect of the critical angle of attack is something every pilot should know and remember. Once the airflow breaks down and is no longer attached to the surface, reducing the angle of attack with forward stick or yoke will reattach the airflow to the wing. No matter what type of aircraft, stall recovery must begin with reducing the angle of attack. Notice in this slide, forward yoke is applied followed by increasing power. Some aircraft, such as those with underwing mounted engines, may have to delay the increase in power until good airflow across the wing is achieved. Stall recovery is generic. Forward stick or yoke to reduce the angle of attack followed by increasing power or thrust. If a stall is allowed to fully develop and there is any asymmetrical lift where one wing stalls later than the other, a spin can develop. Pilots must stop the spin rotation as soon as possible and recover from the stall quickly. A fully developed spin in many aeroplanes can be difficult or impossible to recover from. Therefore, early intervention is essential. Remember the best stall spin technique is avoidance, recognition, then recovery. This accident was Colgan 3407, a Bombardier Q400 near Buffalo, New York in February 2009. This NTSB animation is based on the flight data and cockpit voice recorders and is part of the official record of the accident. The flight originated in Newark, New Jersey and flew nearly 50 minutes towards Buffalo. There was icing present during the flight, and the flight crew commented on the build-up on parts of the aircraft. NTSB was able to determine that the de-icing system was effective in keeping the aerofoils clear of icing during the flight. As usual, the flight was operating on autopilot with the captain as the flying pilot, while the first officer was the pilot monitoring. As they approached the ILS, the air traffic controller issues them a turn to intercept and clears them for the approach to runway 23. 
the captain arms the autopilot for the approach and begins to configure the wing for landing by lowering the first setting of flaps. Now watch carefully as the flight progresses towards the runway. Notice the rapid airspeed decay. The stall warning stick shaker activated, but the captain pulled back, increasing the angle of attack and stalling the aircraft. Notice the rolling caused by the stall. See how the captain continues to pull back on the yoke, preventing the stick pusher from lowering the nose. Sadly, this improper recovery led not to one stall, but three different stalls, each one deeper than the previous one. Because neither of the flight crew members push forward on the yoke, reducing the angle of attack, the stall was not recovered and the aircraft crashed. The crew did not avoid, recognize or recover from the stall. One very important fact to note is that the aeroplane can be stalled in any attitude. The wing only responds to angle of attack. The orientation of the aeroplane does not matter. It is entirely possible to stall the wing while the nose is below the horizon. No matter what the attitude, if the wing is stalled, pilot action must be to push forward on the stick or yoke and unload the wing to allow airflow reattachment. We have mentioned the symptoms of a stall in previous slides. Let us look at them directly. When stalled, any or all of these symptoms may be present. Pilots must recognize any of these symptoms and initiate recovery as early as possible. It is always better to avoid a stall than to recover from one. Remember the Colgan 3407 video? There was buffeting, reduced pitch authority, roll oscillations, and a descent that did not respond to the captain's aft yoke input. The symptoms of stall were present. For a stall recovery, the angle of attack must be reduced. Apply nose down pitch control and maintain it until the stall is recovered. There is the caveat that some underwing mounted engined aeroplanes may need to delay power or thrust application or reduce power or thrust to prevent the angle of attack from increasing. It is always important to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Once the stall is recovered, then the upset recovery can begin if needed. A stalled aeroplane is out of control. It can and should be recovered, but stall recovery must always come first. Decreasing back pressure, or pushing to decrease the angle of attack, has the added benefit of improving the effectiveness of roll control. Unloading the wing allows aileron and or spoilers to roll the aeroplane more quickly, thereby helping in upset recovery. If the aeroplane is stalled, or nearly stalled, stall recovery by reducing angle of attack must be the first step. The Upset Recovery Training Aid provides clear recommendations on recovery from upset conditions, regardless of the cause of the upset. This step-by-step -step method gives pilots the best opportunity to recognize and recover from an upset. Read it and commit it to memory. Should you ever find yourself in an upset, you will be grateful that you did. Like the nose high recovery, the nose low recovery uses a step-by-step -step method. Again, pilots should commit this to memory. Notice that the mention of a stall is present even though the nose is low. Aeroplanes can be stalled in any attitude. Stall characteristics vary depending on the type of aircraft. Propeller-driven straight wings normally stall at the root of the wing first, allowing the ailerons to have some effectiveness during the stall. 
This is not true in swept wings, where the tips can and usually do stall first. Recovery is the same. Reduce angle of attack, which reattaches the airflow and improves the roll control. This short statement makes an important point. If in doubt, unload. In this presentation, we have discussed the theory of upset avoidance, recognition and recovery. That is only part of the overall solution. Practical training is essential. High quality training is possible in advanced simulators and aeroplanes. Pilots need practical and theoretical training in all aspects of upsets. The CAA recommends that practical upset recovery training be a regular part of proficiency for all pilots. Included on this disc are the Upset Recovery Training Aid, Second Revision, the Royal Aeronautical Society's Specialist Document, Aeroplane Upset Recovery Training, and the CAA Safety Information Notice regarding stall recovery.